Thanks. Uh, it's been a long day, and I had this whole thing memorized when I walked in this morning <laughs> at uh, 10.30, and now I may have to cheat a little bit, because I've been a little wrapped up in the talks. Uh, it's been pretty amazing. We are fucked, <laughs> um, at least uh, according to Roy Scranton, the author of the recent book, uh, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. And Scranton's not alone in his assessment of our existential situation as a species. Uh, I want to thank Andy for defining the Anthropocene because I was going to spend a lot of time talking about that and maybe go over. Um, this way I can riff and scat and, and curse a little bit. Um, but the Anthropocene, Andy was actually on the panel recently. This was a contested term for a while, right, to describe this epoch. Um, no longer contested as of last week because the panel that Andy was on of a bunch of international scientists voted not unanimously but overwhelmingly to adopt it as the name. Um, so the Holocene has ended, folks. Uh, welcome to the Anthropocene. And things are going to get weird. Now uh, I should qualify by saying I'm not a scientist, not by a long shot. I am a freaked out artist uh, learning to process the constant cascade of disturbing data. Um, you know, for Scranton, the problem is that the problem is us. We broke our favorite planet, which is why we can't have nice things. Um, and uh, it turns out there are a lot of other artists uh, that are similarly freaking out about the cascade of, of data. Um, so today, I'm not going to uh, show you my own work. I'm going to show you the work of a bunch of other artists. And in fact, these ideas aren't even mine. Um, I lean heavily on people like Roy Scranton, uh, but also Mackenzie Wark and uh, uh, Jennifer Cabot um, and others, uh, mostly writers, mostly thinkers, mostly philosophers. Um, oh, Donna, Donna Haraway, I can't forget her. Um, so I'm going to spend about 15 minutes talking about a lot of work, uh, and we'll kind of look at how these folks are uh, imagining, in some cases, a post-human world. Um, so it's going to be kind of a downer way to end the day, right? <laughs> Apologize for that in advance. A little weird to follow, Andy, but it's cool. I'll work it out. I'll make something up at the end. Um, like I said, I got a lot of pictures. Uh, and most of the work that I will show you, here's my little plug, um, it can be seen in person now through December 10th in an exhibition called Future Perfect, picturing the Anthropocene. That's not plagiarism or uh, 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 you know, an accident. Um, I'm one of the co-curators of that show, along with the director, Janet Riker, and the associate director, Corinna Shamming. So this, by the way, is a photograph by Darius Kinsey um, from 1906. And I love Kinsey's titles because they're kind of like he's describing it to a police sketch artist. This is called Man Lying in the Near-Completed Undercut of a of a nine foot diameter elm surrounded by a wagon load of chips on the ground. And as he ran out of space because he didn't like describe the other guys. Um, so Kinsey was documenting, uh, you know, back when there were no hobbyist photographers, right? This is, this is big, big camera and you basically have to travel with a dark room. Um, documenting the logging industry for the most part in the Pacific Northwest. And he would sell most of his work to the loggers themselves, small uh, affordable prints, and then the large ones he would sell to the, the owners of the logging camps. And the folks who collected these things certainly were celebrating, you know, this heroic uh, uh, triumph over the landscape, right? The state-of-the-art technology of the time, you know, forging the way for progress. Um, and they read differently to me now. Now they read kind of funereal and, and sort of as a, a, like an acknowledgement of, of hubris and maybe like the toddler years of what has turned into mature global capitalism. And you know, speaking of that, uh, capitalist scene is a term that has been uh, proposed by Donna Haraway as the even harder to pronounce uh, alternative for Anthropocene. Um, the idea being that with more specificity and with uh, you know, a kind of uh, more direct moral condemn de condemnation of our uh, appetites, uh, we, could, we could be a little, more, a little more clear about what we mean. This is photographed by Marilyn Bridges from 1986, also documenting uh, the landscape and a, a different kind of heroic progress. Um, this is in California, windmills obviously on ridges. Um, you know, 
but scientists are largely pessimistic about our chances to, to wiggle out from under uh, the potential for extinction, right? Because if, if future behavior is best predicted by past behavior, I don't like the odds. Um, and that's, a, that's kind of a drag to think about, right? Um, you know, Andy touched on this in his talk. It, by the time, and this is not me talking, this is, this is you know, science. Um, by the time the effects of global climate change are ubiquitous and, and local enough to get our attention, really, um, it will have been too late. And you can keep score of the, time, the number of times that I use the future perfect tense, because it's like my clever little thing I'm going to do a lot. Um, will have been too late. Um, and I'm losing my place now. Oh, this is called Tweed. I didn't want to forget to, to the name of this. It's Tweed Field, Leroy, New York. Um, and that's heavy stuff to contemplate, right? Which is why we mostly don't. We mostly don't contemplate it, because it's a drag. Um, you know, human beings are genetically wired to assume that because yesterday was a lot like today, then tomorrow is going to be a lot like today was. Um, and speaking of genetics, we're also wired to thrive and survive, so that's on our side. Except that we're wired to survive even at the expense of our host. And uh, in 1976, um, there's a book written called The Selfish Gene by uh, Richard Dawkins. And he kind of talks about, touches on this a little bit. And as much as I could understand that, because it got really, really technical about genetics and, and evolution, at the end, he makes this sort of moral charge for human beings to behave a little less like genes. Right? Because civilization might just grind to a halt. This is a painting by Caspar David Friedrich from 1824, I think. It's called Sea of Ice. Friedrich was uh, instrumental in, in transforming landscape painting from just a backdrop for human drama, literally, uh, to its own drama, its own self-contained uh, drama. This is a photograph by the artist James Casebeer from 2010, called Sea of Ice. Case Beer removes the human drama completely by taking away the, the, the sinking ship that was in the background of the Friedrich painting. Case Beer's career spans uh, 40 odd years. Um, he's not an artist in the show, I just really wanted to show his work. Um, <laughs> and, and he increasingly documents our increasing footprint on the planet, mostly by constructing models in his uh, Brooklyn studio. And the, the, the sort of uh, incredible thing about the prints, and, and, and when you experience a, a James Casebeer photograph as a print, as an object, they're monumental. They're, they're three times the size of this projection, some of them, m many of them, this one. Uh, and so you kind of fall into it, right? Or, or you look through it like a window, and you see this complete world on the other side. Then you notice the little things that are wrong because of the excruciating descriptive capabilities of a large format camera. He shoots with 4x5 or 8x10 cameras, so they're like, you know, like 4 to 10 gigabyte images um, to make these massive prints. Uh, and then you realize, oh no, this is a tiny world. So that shift in scale kind of, it's like a little earthquake in your brain. You kind of go, wait, I thought I was somewhere and I'm nowhere, right? More modest sized photograph by an artist in the show, Ken Ragsdale. Um, Ragsdale makes some of the weirdest uh, tableaus that you'll ever see. Entirely made from memory, he makes these patterns out of paper and folds them together into little models and photographs them very, very carefully. Um, cites Case Beer as a big influence for obvious reasons. Okay, who here has heard of the Voynich Manuscript? Come on. <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, rest of y'all, Google it. Man. Um, all right, so this may be one of the weirdest documents in human history. Hand illustrated, handwritten codex in an unknown language. How many unknown languages are there? Right, this thing, since the 15th century, nobody's been able to translate it. Not translators, not scholars, not even the NSA, the cryptographers in the intelligence community, know what this says. 272 pages, so historians are like, why would anyone do that? Why would anyone make something that can't be read? And yet, I know a lot of artists who do that, right? <laughs> they make stuff that's not that, not that you know, it's, uh, it's very sort of uh, uh, novelty is its opacity. 
Miljan Reperto and Ulrich Heltoft, collaborative artist duo this year, made these gelatin silver prints uh, based on the Voynich manuscript, based directly on the Voynich manuscript. A gelatin silver print is, uh, I gotta, I'm a photography teacher, I gotta do this. Uh, it's a traditional chemically produced black and white photograph from a negative. These are made entirely in 3D rendering software on the computer and then a single film recording or, or sheet of film is generated and then prints are made. Uh, and they're magnificent prints and they look like shit here and I apologize for that. Uh, so you gotta come to the show and you gotta see them, right? You gotta see them up close. Joanne Carson, uh, positioned cleverly across from Mil John Ruperto's work, um, makes these kind of hybrid forms. And her you know, exuberant use of color and this kind of a, a language or line quality that's informed by cartoons is a little more celebratory, right? I mean, so, so Carson, I think, is kind of envisioning uh, a less dark side of a post-human landscape, and these might be creatures that would thrive in the Anthropocene. This is by Alexander Ross. Uh, we have a few um, artists in residence in the show, meaning uh, they've been asked to come and produce new work specifically for the exhibition. Um, one of whom I'll talk about in a second. The uh, work isn't maybe even going to be done by the show, time the show closes. Um, and this is called Sneck and was produced just for the show. Uh, Ross is, a, is an internationally known painter. Um, and I think of this as kind of the poster child for the whole endeavor. It's like all the flora and the fauna have kind of, you know, morphed together and are looking back at us like, really? <laughs> and so, you know, Ross's work, for me anyway, uh, it's like a little bit of a, of a uh, comforting or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, not a celebration, but um, I'm going to find the word because it's good. Oh, I'm still on the Voynich manuscript. And see, this is what happens. See, Rosemary Armeo gave me permission to do this by just throwing her paper around. It's okay to have notes. I didn't know it would be okay. So, um, yeah. Well, was, anyway. Um, so he helps us visualize, you know, a world maybe that that we're not a part of, or at least not this iteration of us. He works in this weird way, though this curious, protracted way. I mean, the forms are instantly kind of recognizable, sort of in a photographic way. Those of you who are down with Photoshop will recognize, you know, there's like messy gradients that he does in, in the background. Um, and it kind of begs the question, like, what if we don't fix this, right? We should, we could, yeah, we probably won't. Um, so what will life look like? Because life will thrive, right? It will continue to thrive, but it's not gonna look like me. So Ross, you know, he, he will look through a microscope at stuff, I don't know what stuff, and he'll make a drawing, and then he'll make a clay model from the drawing, then photograph the clay model, uh, print it out, make another drawing, and then make a larger painting. Um, and you can actually, he, for the first time ever, he's showing the stages, right? The, the, thing, the intermediate steps that led to the work. And it's pretty amazing, because you get to see not just his working process, but his thinking process. This is a hunk of Fordite, otherwise known as Detroit agate. It's automobile paint that has hardened sufficiently to be cut and polished like a gemstone. And it's found in Detroit in the environment from overspray over the years from painting cars. So to look at a, at a, at a rock like that is to be sort of teleported to the future and look at the present as if it's the past, right? And I show you that to contextualize the work of Amy Brenner. These are called recliner. And Brenner's work is made out of uh, like all toxic materials, like resin and plexiglass and fiberglass and plastic and, and you know, electronics that are you know, embedded in them. And they're maybe the most literal manifestation of, of our presence being manifest you know, in, in the, sort of the, the sedimentary layers of, of the rock of the planet. And yet they're not shrill and they're not didactic. This isn't an illustration of, a, of an idea because it's not really an idea. It's just a reflection, right? It's a vibration. It's like, you know, what, what, if, what if this is it? What? So this is Letha, Letha Willis, Wilson? Wilson, not Williams, Wilson. Uh, Letha Wilson's photographs 
uh, they kind of exploit the viewer's willingness or, or ability to instantly recognize a landscape in a flat piece of paper and then subvert it. That's sort of her one-two trick. Um, this is a, a C print, which is a chemical-based traditional color photograph of salt flats dipped in Portland cement. Cement is key here, concrete. There's really no better apt metaphor for the fantasy of permanence, right? I mean, we build bridges out of it. We built a whole fucking plaza in Albany out of it, permanence and, and you know, the sort of like high modernist, uh, uh, you know, what? Um, egotistical fantasy of being around forever. And it's made out of sand, and it's going to crumble just like everything else. This is a C print embedded in concrete and Corten steel, and then pierced with a giant hole in the center of it. It's another one dipped in Portland cement of salt flats. And there's something about this work that reminds me of something that my brother, who's a playwright and, and, and a, a brilliant actor, um, who tried to teach me how to meditate because, you know, when I would get worked up about stuff like this, he thought it would help. Um, it didn't take, but he would say to me, as hard as you hang on to shit, that's how hard you have to let go. And then you have to let go harder because you've been hanging on for so long. So, and he, and he tapped it. I used to be a, a, I'm a retired amateur bicycle racer, so he thought he could tap into my athletic mojo. He's like, you gotta, you gotta go deep into your letting go. You gotta let go harder and harder and harder, and it didn't work. Because I, I suck at meditation, and I think we suck at letting go, right? Just as a species. Um, and, you know, I will happily entertain the notion that extinction is not around the corner, right? I have kids. Um, I would prefer that it's not. But a lot of what these artists are dealing with is, what if it is? We could maybe fix this and we probably won't, and so what if we don't? Colin Boyd is the other artist in residence, and he was invited, yeah, one minute, no way, man. <laughs> okay. I have 19 more slides. <laughs> no, I, got, I got two more. Um, Colin, uh, when I asked him to be in the show, uh, I invited him to do something that he's never done before, and maybe uh, I knew that he was kind of between spaces. He runs Collar Works in Troy, New York, or he's one of the people. He doesn't run it single-handedly, who runs that great gallery. Um, he'd never done this stop-motion animation that was in his brain. Um, he's a sculptor, right? So we invited him to have a space. So he has a, he has a studio set up in the museum. And these don't look anything like this anymore. These sculptural objects are actually live sets for the production of this, of this animation. And they change literally daily, and they, like I said, they're completely transformed now. So this is this stop motion animation um, of these critters that are sort of prehistoric, post-apocalyptic, mammal robots that kind of just scurry around. It's non-narrative. Um, and I don't know if we'll see the end of it. I don't know if we'll even get to, to see it in the end. Um, okay, so this is the part where I have to kind of wrap it up and bring it home. And leave you with something uplifting. Uh, yeah. You know. <laughs> I got a lot of stuff I lined through. It's like, no, that won't work. Um, you know, so I guess I, I'll turn back to Scranton, who, who posits as the, the, you know, supposed hero of our future, the interrupter, right, with a capital I. The interrupter who interrupts lazy, habitual thought with a charge not to be complacent and not to uh, uh, pretend to fix a broken world, but to actually practice imagining building a new one amongst its ruins. You know, because, and, and, and I would say that as, as much hope as I have in, in scientists and people who work really hard on this every day of their lives, and there's a lot of them, I also have, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe buoyed by art and the humanities, right? Because art and, and, and poetry encourage us to ask questions that we kind of don't want to know the answer to. And whatever those answers are, you know, maybe we can help each other process and deal and accept the answers with humility, maybe grace, like humans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, where is this exhibition? Oh, yeah. <laughs>
It's at the University Museum, Art Museum uh, on the U Albany campus, State University of New York in Albany. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. How are we doing? Oh, we're way over. Yeah, you're way over. Uh, do, do you have a uh, question? Two? I think they're just. Yes, I know, I know. Way back. Um, how hard is it to document the present or the future beings, whatever they are? How hard is it? How important for you is it? To, do you think we should doc be documenting our present state? Can you read that for us? Uh, Anna, <laughs> my former studio assistant and student, who's now a grad student. Uh, New Paltz. Um, she asked, how important is it to document uh, the present? I was like, I think it's the most important thing. I mean, to, to, to be so cynical as to say, like, well, who are we documenting it for? You know, no one's going to be around. Um, no, no, no. I mean, the, the conversation is, is key, right? And, you know, producing work, producing poems, producing plays, producing, you know, all of that stuff that makes us human. Um, that might be like all there is in a way. Um, if we're not gonna last, and maybe we will, maybe we won't. Uh, I don't know where I'm going here, but yeah, I think it's super important. I think it's real important. It's what, you know, obviously I think it's the most important thing in the world.